Elimination reactions are reactions that form alkenes. These elimination reactions occur with the same substrates that undergo SN1 and SN2, so we'll need to be able to recognize the conditions that favor substitution and elimination. Let's begin by briefly reviewing an SN1 reaction. This tertiary alcohol can be treated with HCl. This will result in the protonation of the alcohol to make it a good leaving group. An intermediate carbocation will form, and then the Cl- will come back and attack, producing this product. This reaction competes with an elimination reaction called E1. Let's take our same alcohol, but instead of treating it with an acid that contains a good nucleophile, Cl- is a good nucleophile, let's treat it with an acid that has a conjugate base that's not very nucleophilic. Sulfuric acid will do. Again, we get protonation of the alcohol, it leaves on its own, and we form this intermediate carbocation. HSO4- is very resonance stabilized. It's not going to want to attack this carbocation. Instead, something in the solution is going to deprotonate one of the hydrogen atoms adjacent to the carbocation. So here's one of these hydrogen atoms drawn out. Sulfuric acid, even when concentrated, contains a bit of water. So I'm going to draw that out. Water is more basic than the conjugate base of sulfuric acid. And so we'll show this doing a deprotonation to form an alkene. And the product we'll get looks like this. Now let's review SN2 reactions. For our example, we'll start with 2-chlorobutane. Treat it with sodium cyanide. And in a single step, we'll get replacement of chlorine with our nucleophile CN-, giving a product with inversion of stereochemistry. You may have guessed it, based on SN1 and E1, the reaction that competes with SN2 is called E2. For this example, let's use 2-bromobutane. We'll treat this with sodium methoxide, and for good measure, we'll heat it. Elimination reactions are favored at higher temperatures, so elimination reactions will typically be carried out at room temp or above. Under these strong base conditions, instead of substituting the bromine with the OME, the OME is instead going to attack a proton on the carbon next door. Just like the SN2 mechanism, E2 takes place in one step. The methoxide attacks the proton, these electrons push in to form our alkene, and bromine is eliminated. From this reaction, we'll get a mixture of alkenes resulting from the arrow pushing I've shown here, with the less crowded E alkene being the major product. The reaction gives 81% of this mixture. Now we're also going to get 19% of another product. Now this product is formed from elimination on this carbon, giving a less substituted alkene. What I mean by less substituted is, you see on the alkene we have two hydrogens on this side, and on this side we have one hydrogen and one alkyl group. Whereas in these alkenes, we have one alkyl group sticking off of each side and then one hydrogen. So these have two substituents coming off of the alkene, whereas this just has the one. The propensity to form the more substituted alkenes as the major product is referred to as Zaitsev's rule. You may see this spelled a few different ways, maybe with an S here. That is because the name is originally Russian, so this is our attempt to translate it into Latin characters. This less substituted product is sometimes referred to as the Hoffman product. Under specific reaction conditions with specific leaving groups, we can favor the Hoffman product in these reactions. We won't have time to go over that in this video, but you can look that up if you need to know it. Okay, I want to introduce one more related elimination mechanism. This is called E1CB. Let's show an example. When we treat this compound with sodium hydroxide and maybe warm it up a little bit, we get this product of elimination. Now, this might seem a little confusing. In the previous videos, we talked about hydroxide being a poor leaving group. And it still is, but this mechanism is a little bit different, and it allows hydroxide to leave. Let's look at why. First, we'll draw out the proton that we want to deprotonate. NaOH comes in and removes that proton. 
And when we remove this, instead of just pushing the electrons up onto carbon, we'll be able to take these electrons and push them through the conjugated system. So we remove our proton, form a double bond here, and push electrons up onto oxygen. Now this deprotonation is our slow rate determining step. With the assistance of this pushing the electrons back down and pushing this double bond over, now hydroxide can leave and produce this product called an enone. I think E1CB is pretty easy to recognize because we, what you'll have is a leaving group, even a poor leaving group, two carbons away, usually from a carbonyl or some anion stabilizing group. But this is the really typical example that you'll probably need to know for undergraduate OCHEM. In both E1 and E2 reactions, the E alkene is favored, so with these groups on the opposite sides, not this Z product with the groups on the same side. We'll need to look at the transition states for these reactions to see why that is so. Now in this particular E1 example, we had this symmetrically substituted carbocation. It eliminated and doesn't really give an E or Z alkene since we don't have substituents on this side. Let's look at an example where we get the E alkene and we have a choice between E and Z. If we treat this with H2SO4, we'll produce a carbocation. Now a base is going to come in and deprotonate here. This group could be in this orientation and the transition state might look like this. Our base is coming in, forming a partial bond with this hydrogen. We have a partial double bond forming here, and delta positive character where the carbocation is. We can also envision another conformation where this CH3 is flipped down, and the base is coming in from the top. We have the base coming in and starting to form a bond with the hydrogen. The hydrogen is breaking, a double bond is forming and we still have a little bit of partial positive character at that carbon atom. Well, in this transition state, it's more crowded. This phenyl and CH3 are on the same side. They're kind of bumping into each other. We have this steric interaction. And because of the steric hindrance, this transition state is going to be favored with the groups on opposite sides, leading to the formation of the E alkene preferentially. Now, in the simple example of the E2 reaction that we outlined above, we get the Zaitsev's products with formation of the E alkene as major. This is because in that example, there are actually two alpha protons that we can deprotonate. However, as we'll see near the end of the video, there are important exceptions to Zaitsev's rule with E2 eliminations. In order to identify these, we have to be able to look at the transition state carefully. So let's get into that now. In order to do this elimination all in one step, the molecule needs to adopt one of two conformations. This conformation is called antiperiplanar. The way this is drawn, this hydrogen, this carbon-carbon bond and the leaving group are all in the same plane. They're drawn in the plane of the paper whereas these groups on the tetrahedral carbon are pointing forward and back and forward and back. The groups can also be syn-periplanar. And so here the hydrogen and the leaving group are again in the same plane up here, but they're on the same side of the molecule. The reason that periplanar geometry is so important relates to molecular orbitals. I'm going to draw these to look like p orbitals. They're sp hybrid orbitals at this point that are turning into p orbitals, but the p orbital is just a little easier to draw, so I'm going to do that right now. So this hydrogen atom is in its orbital, and this leaving group is in an orbital facing the same direction. As we're deprotonating here, we're starting to form a new pi bond. So these orbitals need to be lined up in the same direction so that we can have good orbital overlap in the transition state. With the antiperiplanar geometry, same story. Let's draw an orbital for our hydrogen atom and one for our leaving group. And as this pi bond is forming, these will line up. The transition states will look like this. For the antiperiplanar transition state, the base is forming a partial bond to hydrogen. That bond is breaking to carbon, we have the double bond partially forming, and a breaking bond to our leaving group. 
In the sin periplanar transition state, we have the base coming in, all of these partial bonds, and the X group is breaking, leaving from the top. That allows for our good orbital overlap. But one thing that we need to notice about the sin periplanar transition state is that we have eclipsing interactions. In order for the hydrogen and the leaving group to get into plane, these groups are eclipsed with each other. So although E2 eliminations can proceed by the sin periplanar elimination transition state, the anti-periplanar is much more favored since these groups are actually staggered in the Newman projection. Because this anti-periplanar geometry is so important in E2 reactions, being able to see this is important for predicting the products you'll get from reactions. Let's look at two examples. We'll apply a Newman projection and a chair to make sure that you can deal with these types of problems when you see them. Here's our first problem. This chloride, when treated with NaOH, is going to predominantly give one single product. Predict that product. Okay, to approach this, we need to draw a Newman projection. And I find it easy to add all my groups in. We have some implied hydrogen atoms here and here, and I wanna account for those in my Newman, so I'm just going to draw them with their appropriate stereochemistry now. So here we have a hydrogen coming out at us, and this one is going into the page. Now for our Newman projection, we need to imagine we're looking down the carbon-carbon bond where the alkene is going to form. To do that, we need to look down this carbon-carbon bond. So let's draw the front of our Newman projection. So here's my front carbon, and I'm going to keep my phenyl ring pointing downward. What I'm thinking of doing is lifting this up and turning it so I can look down this bond. And now this CH3 is pointing backward into the piece of paper. So when I turn this up, it's going to be on the left side. Now let me draw the lines for the substituents on the back carbon. This phenyl ring was in plane with this phenyl ring, and so these should be lined up. The phenyl is going to go across from this phenyl. And now we're still turning the molecule this way, and so this hydrogen was pointing back. It's going to come around like this and end up over here on my Newman projection. And this Cl that was forward is going to be on the same side as the H, so I'm going to put that right here. If it was hard for you to see how I drew in the groups on this Newman, you might want to use your model kit at first. Build the molecule you're looking at, turn it in space, you can physically turn your mo model, and then you can look down that carbon atom for real and draw out your Newman projection. Now if we had a choice of two hydrogen atoms to deprotonate here, we'd put them both in an anti-periplanar conformation with the leaving group and see which Newman was the lowest energy. That would be the one with least steric interactions, and that's why we often get the E alkene. However, here we only have one choice of hydrogen atom to deprotonate. So this hydrogen here and this chlorine need to become anti-periplanar. If I envision moving my back carbon to do that, the chlorine will have to move here, turn here, the hydrogen will turn up, the phenyl ring will come where the chlorine was. So I've just drawn some arrows to show that rotation, and then let's draw what we get. We kept our front carbon atom oriented the same way, so let's just redraw these groups in the same spot. And now we'll draw our back carbon with everything rotated 120 degrees. I've circled these in red, they're the groups that are going to be eliminated. And now it gets pretty easy for me to see the product from this particular structure. These groups are going to be on the same side of the alkene on different carbon atoms, and these groups are going to be on the same side of the alkene. Now if that's not super easy for you to see, I would redraw this with the hydrogen and chlorine eliminated, and then stretch out these groups so that they're 180 degrees from each other the way we're, we're looking at them. So on our front carbon, our phenyl is down, the hydrogen is gone, and then our CH3 group is going to adjust upward. On the back carbon atom, we're losing chlorine. So we'll need to position our phenyl and our hydrogen. Okay, so now in this projection, we're looking down a double bond. So let's straighten that out and draw our product up here. So here's our alkene. If we're turning this this way, the CH3 group will be pointing up over here and the phenyl will be pointing down. And now our hydrogen atom is on the same side as the CH3 and the phenyls are 
both on the same side. So this example actually produces a Z alkene because of the stereochemistry at these carbon atoms. Another case where the antiperiplanar geometry becomes very important is chair cyclohexane. For this problem, we're treating this cyclohexane with a tosylate leaving group with strong base, NaOET. Now, in these acyclic examples, we form the more substituted alkene as the major product. But in this case, we need to make sure by drawing a chair that hydrogen atoms are actually antiperiplanar to our leaving group. There's a hydrogen atom here that can eliminate to form the more substituted alkene, and there's two hydrogen atoms here that are also potentially able to eliminate. So let's draw our chair. Begin with your two parallel lines, draw two more parallel lines, and finally connect everything. Now in order to adopt the antiperiplanar geometry on the chair, we actually need our groups to be axial. So we'll have an axial hydrogen atom and an axial leaving group will allow for the antiperiplanar geometry. This otosyl group is above the ring. That's our leaving group. And so I already know that I need to get these substituents axial for antiperiplanar geometry in the elimination. And so what I'm going to do is choose a position to start at for the tosyl group where this can be axial up. Well, this point right here has an axial up position and then the equatorial position sticking out. So I'll place my O tosyl group here. Okay, coming counterclockwise, we have this CH3 group pointing down. Well, here, counterclockwise, this is our position that we're traveling in, and the group needs to be down. On this carbon, we have an equatorial position that's pointing up and an axial position pointing down. So right here is where our methyl group is going to go, and this light blue line is where our hydrogen atom is. Well, that hydrogen atom that could form the more substituted alkene by elimination is actually not antiperiplanar to our tosyl group. Instead, we're going to have to use one of the hydrogen atoms that's on this carbon to do our elimination because one of those is going to be antiperiplanar. So now the sodium ethoxide can come in. It'll deprotonate this antiperiplanar hydrogen atom. The electrons can push in, eliminating our tosyl group with good orbital overlap. So we were able to use this chair to see that it's one of these hydrogen atoms that needs to eliminate and that this one is not in the correct geometry to do so. In the next video in this series, I'm going to summarize what we know about substitution and elimination reactions for each of the substrates that we're familiar with. But I want to leave you with just one thought here, and that's that strong base really promotes E2 eliminations. And so it's good to leave off with some examples of these strong bases. So before we quit, let's make a little list of these. We have hydroxide. This could be in the form of NaOH or KOH. We have the ethoxides, OME minus, OET minus. I'll just put OR here. Usually these have a sodium counter ion, so you might see NaOME or NaOET. A common, very hindered base that is used often in eliminations is a form of this, but it's sodium terbutoxide. This terbutyl group is very large, so this base is good at promoting elimination, even on primary halides. Some nitrogen-centered bases that you might see in these reactions are NaNH2, so we can write this as NH2 minus, and another compound that is sometimes seen is lithium diisopropyl amide, or LDA. This is another nitrogen-centered base that looks like this. It has a lithium counter ion. The trend you should be noticing here is the negative charge on either oxygen or nitrogen that makes quite strong bases, and strong bases and heat will favor E2 eliminations.